Thank you, everyone, uh, for coming to the uh, uh, today's Journal Club. And so uh, Darius and I are actually going to be starting off with the first presentation. And um, so my name is Devine Wafor. I'm a sixth year MD PhD student at West Virginia University. And so for today's talk, we're going to be focusing on a clinical trial that was actually conducted in the United Kingdoms. And uh, essentially the trial was looking at the effect of uh, dexamethasone, which is a glucocorticoid in the treat for the treatment of chronic subdural hematomas. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. My name is Zersa, I'm, I'm a first year medical student. And if you want to start Divine, go ahead. Right. Oh, do you mind, uh, next slide. All right. So just to give you guys uh, a little bit of uh, background on, you know, some of the context, you know, to why this study was actually done uh, has to focus on, you know, uh, looking into, you know, the ep uh, epidemiology and management of uh, chronic subdural hematoma, uh, which I'm just going to call CSDH from here on. Um, so uh, when we look at chronic subdural hematoma, it's usually just a collection of blood or blood breakdown products in the subdural uh, space. And you can see here in the picture on the right um, where the, uh, the blood can be found, uh, you know, right above the, uh, the brain. And it's actually in between that and the dura. Uh, this is very different from epidural hematoma, which is usually found right above the dura uh, shown here uh, in this diagram. Um, so one thing you can start to appreciate uh, on the CT scan shown below um, is the, uh, the, the presence of the subdural hematoma, especially in the acute phase, uh, tends to present as a hyper um, uh, dense signal. And so it usually has this uh, crescentic hematoma shape. And uh, that's because uh, the, you know, the blood that accumulates in the subdural space is able to cross suture lines, uh, which is very different in the case of an epidural hematoma. And so what are the predisposing factors where you would see a subdural hematoma? So one of the most common uh, predisposing risks is, you know, uh, usually seen in the elderly populations from falls as well as uh, in alcoholics. And it's usually due to a disruption of the bridging veins, as you can see here, um, that, um, feed into like structures such as the superior saturated sinus. And so when we look at the, you know, the pathophysiology and the progression of subdural uh, uh, hematomas, uh, you can see, you know, in the acute phase, as I mentioned uh, in the previous CT scan, uh, you can see this hyper dense signal. And at nine days, it pretty much becomes very uh, isodense, whereby, you know, the signal uh, pretty much equilibrates, equilibrates to the, uh, uh, the brain parenchyma signal. But, you know, after 27 days, it actually becomes more of a hyperdense signal. And you can see the hypodensity there, whereby, you know, the subdural hematoma actually becomes darker than the brain parenchyma. And so for the prevalence of subdural hematoma, it's actually, uh, you know, quite prevalent uh, in persons per year, uh, about 14 cases uh, per 100,000 persons per year. And, you know, there's actually a higher risk uh, of, you know, having chronic subdural hematomas if you are uh, uh, a male compared to being a female, and again, with age being the uh, biggest risk factor for predisposition. And, you know, uh, it's, you know, so how did these uh, chronic subdural hematomas actually uh, arise from? So obviously, one being, you know, they could arise from patients that have had acute subdural hematomas, or something, you know, that Dr. Nopman actually mentioned last week, where, you know, there's this idea of neurovascularization, whereby vessels that actually are formed are not pain enough. And then you get this misinformed uh, angiogenesis and leakage of blood into the subdural space. And, uh, and often the case, it's usually due to a subdur subdural hydroma, which is just a collection of CSF um, between uh, in the uh, subdural space. And so what are the clinical presentations in patients that tend to have uh, chronic subdural hematomas? It's uh, very, very heterogeneous in the sense that it's dubbed the great imitator because uh, usually most of the presentations tend to depend on, you know, what part of the brain, you know, the subdural uh, hematoma might be affecting. And so most of these patients tend to be managed you know, first by correcting whatever coagulopathy that might be present. 
as well as uh, surgical uh, intervention to drain the uh, subdural hematoma. And so there are just some of the uh, few uh, surgical management uh, uh, techniques, surgical techniques that are often used to manage subdural hematomas. And so the borehole craniostomy just requires that, you know, you make two boreholes that are about five to eight centimeters away from each other. And um, essentially, then you would set a drain at that drains uh, the, uh, uh, the collection of uh, blood in the subdural space. Uh, you could also do something that's called the twist through craniostomy. And so that's actually uh, done typically under local anesthesia. And it's actually done preferably for the elderly population uh, 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 compared to the borehole, which tends to require general anesthesia. And obviously, you know, with the most extreme being the, uh, the craniotomy, which requires uh, removing a bone flap to drain the subdural hematoma. Um, next slide. So uh, one of the key objectives uh, that you know, this study was trying to answer was um, you know, if patients that have symptomatic uh, SSD, uh, CSDH, uh, if they were given dexamethasone, which is a glucocorticoid, uh, was there going to be an uh, alleviation of their symptoms as well as an improvement in functional status? Um, so the rationale for doing a study like this is um, with CSDH, the prevalence is actually increasing every year, especially due to the aging population, as well as the increased use of anticoagulants. And, you know, Dr. Knopman also mentioned uh, from his lecture that, you know, CSDH is going to be one of the most common cranial neurosurgical operations by the year 2030. And not only that, you know, beyond the prevalence, uh, patients that do have uh, CSDH are burdened with cognitive and functional impairments. And this is actually um, well illustrated again, you know, with those patients showing very heterogeneous pre uh, clinical presentations that might range from cognitive impairments, such as memory loss, all the way to things like ataxia. Um, so why is there an interest in studying dexamethasone? So this actually, this interest actually arose from preclinical pre um, uh, systemic review studies and meta-analysis that actually showed that, you know, uh, in some case reports where patients were actually given uh, CS years, uh, it uh, denotes um, uh, corticosteroids and surgery versus C being corticosteroids alone and S being surgery. So patients that actually got this actually had a better neurological outcome than surgery, as well as when you look at the secondary intervention rate, which was just like, you know, uh, whether there was uh, a secondary surgical intervention following the first uh, drainage, you see that, you know, patients that had both corticosteroids and surgery actually did better in terms of not having uh, a secondary intervention. And then when we look at mortality, uh, lethality in terms of mortality, it's also decreased in patients that got uh, corticosteroids, again, being the such things as dexamethasone. And so the hypothesis has been proposed here is dexamethasone when compared to placebo, which is the control in this case, would improve uh, outcomes in patients that have symptomatic uh, CSDH. Next slide. And so the study paradigm for this was actually designed again in the United Kingdoms. Uh, it was multi-centered randomized control uh, trial. And so uh, the patients were either given dexamethasone or matched with placebo as the control. And this treatment was actually given for two weeks uh, with tapering. And you know the dosing scheme is shown here. Um, whereby uh, the patients were given from eight milligrams all the way to 10 milligrams. And you can see that uh, as every two days, you had like a two milligram decrease and this was given twice per day. And you can see that the last day actually, we, they actually gave it uh, one per day on days 12 and four. And some of the key things to sort of note from the, you know, the patient that would actually uh, uh, enrolled in this study was that uh, the patients range from ages uh, 18 all the way um, to 70 something. And you can clearly see that the median age was actually in the 70 something area, which again, that's the key population you want to be studying, uh, especially since the elderly population tends to be affected in CSDH. Uh, there was a higher prevalence of males compared to females in the study. Uh, when we looked at head trauma, there were more head trauma patients compared to patients that didn't have any head trauma. Uh, there were no patients with um, acute subdural hematomas included in the study. Uh, only patients with uh, symptomatic CSDH were included in this study. 
And just looking at the table to your right, you can clearly see that, uh, you know, the percentages across all groups, uh, starting off with the age, were pretty much well balanced, as well as the sex between both groups. And, you know, some of the patients here also had like comorbid conditions and, you know, the trial made sure that it was balanced across the dexamethasone as well as the placebo groups. Uh, next slide. And so some of the things that a lot of clinical trials tend to look out is uh, the primary and the secondary outcomes uh, for their data collection. And so one of the things that was used to uh, assess functional status in the patients that got either placebo or dexamethasone uh, with surgery um, was the Rankin scale, the modified Rankin scale. And so this scale was actually uh, developed uh, by a lot of uh, stroke um, clinicians. And uh, but however, it's used by uh, a lot of groups to look at functional status in, their, uh, in a myriad of neurological diseases. And so you can clearly see here, it's a skill that it's usually listed as zero to six. Obviously on this table here, uh, six is not included because six means uh, the death of the patient. Um, so you can really assess that. And so the patients that tend to have a skill of zero to three tend to have a, a favorable outcome, whereas patients that have four to six tend to be regarded as, as having an unfavorable outcome. And you can see that it's just looking at, you know, slight disability would be a, a score of two, whereas um, severe disability would be a score of five. And so the other thing that they looked at was in the secondary outcomes was using the uh, GCS scale, the glucose gamma scale, to look at uh, neurological status in this patient. And uh, they also used the Rankin scale again, three months after discharge um, to assess uh, some of the functional status in the patient. But it was interesting, they actually used uh, something that's known as the Bathel Index, and that looks at, looks at the uh, activities of daily living in the patients. And it just takes into account, you know, what were the patients doing before they had this event, and are they able to still keep up with things like that? And so you can clearly see on the graph to the right uh, below the ranking scale, the Bathel Index uh, table, um, it's, uh, you know, assigned, the patients are assigned different scores being uh, based on what they're able to perform. Uh, so is the patient, for instance, is the patient able to feed themselves without any help? Um, and so they would probably get a score of uh, five or eight, depending on how they're able to do it. If they're fully to do it independent on their own, then they would get a score of 10. And so this range, this score actually ranges from zero to 100. And it's, again, it's just looking at, you know, uh, what are the activities of daily events that this, the patients could perform on their own. All right, next slide. here for the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So for the exclusion criteria, it was um, if the patient had a history of psychotic disorders or they were unable to receive the first dose of dexamethasone or the placebo within the 72 hours after admission, or if they had an acute subdural hematoma, they were excluded from the study. So at the end, 750 um, patients were enrolled and they underwent uh, randomization um, throughout the story, uh, the study, a few of them withdrew, um, were lost to follow up or withdrew consent. Um, at the end, for the dexamethasone group, 341 patients were evaluated at six months. And um, for the placebo group, 339 patients were evaluated at six months. And just some um, to give you a little bit more background. So the baseline characteristics uh, characteristics were similar in both um, trial groups. So 59.9% of the patients had a score of one to three in the modifying ranking scale, um, and 94.3% had a score of uh, 13 to 15 on the um, Glasgow Coma Scale at admission. 70% uh, of these patients had a history of head trauma. 94.2% uh, of them underwent surgical evacuation of the hematoma uh, present at initial admission. And over 95% of them had surgery during the index admission and less than 5% during the subsequent um, admission. Then for results for the primary outcomes, um, I just want to uh, refresh your memory that a, um, a positive result was that that zero to three in the, uh, in the modified ranking scale. 
And overall, the placebo group had more favorable outcomes. So um, only 83.9% in the dexamethasone group um, had scores of zero to three. Um, there was an increase in morbidity was seen also in this group. And then again, this other graph is just another way to see uh, the results. So it was uh, organized in an increasing grade of severity. So all the shades of blue are zero to three, which are favorable resort results. And then yellow to red are more um, unfavorable outcomes. And red represents the death. And as you can see, there were more deaths reported in the dexamethasone group at three and six months. Next for the secondary and tertiary outcomes. Um, so the surgery for CSH at index of admission was 91.7% uh, in the dexamethasone group and 89.2% in the placebo group. Also repeated surgery for recurrence of CSH was higher in the placebo group. Uh, I just want to um, say that this actually proves part of the uh, initial hypothesis of this study. Um, however, the adverse events and risk of infections were higher in the dexamethasone group. Um, the risk of infection, because dexamethasone being a glucocorticoid, it um, suppresses your immune system, so that might be the reason for that. And, um, and then something that we were wondering is whether like those adverse events were because there was a higher uh, percentage of patients who underwent surgery in the dexamethasone group. And lastly, the mean EQ 5D um, slash 5L utility index, which was like um, a self-administered uh, questionnaire that each participant took home, um, it was higher in the um, placebo group. Then for conclusions and limitations of this study, um, overall patients who received dexamethasone uh, treatment following surgical evacuation of CSH had worse outcomes at three and six months compared to those um, patients receiving placebo treatment. Um, this conclusion is an overall conclusion given the fact that many of those patients um, received surgical treatment prior to the administration of the, of the trial. And then for some of the limitations, uh, surgical treatment of patients at admissions with um, which kind of like uh, it limits our ability to draw any conclusion on the management of CSH uh, conservatively by just um, administering uh, dexamethasone. Um, I do want to know that the small group of patients that did not receive any surgery showed less adverse events in the placebo group. And then also there was a lack of imaging during the trial and trial outcomes. And um, it kind of like didn't allow us to see the effect of this amethysone on this actual size of the CSH. And um, Divan, if you want to take the last two. Yes, um, so I, something else to uh, take in mind with the limitations of the study that I sort of noticed was, um, you know, it's not really clear if, you know, dexamethasone could be beneficial to some of the patients that had the comor comorbid conditions. Um, uh, I think the author should have uh, done some more certification of the data in terms of uh, not only just like looking at that aspect alone, but also looking at, you know, the sex differences that could be present, uh, given that uh, most of their um, the participants in the studies were mostly males. Uh, it's very clear that, um, you know, with various tissues in the organs that in your body, sorry, um, it, that GR receptor, which is the glucocorticoid receptor is differentially expressed between females and males. And perhaps uh, there could be a plausible sex difference that could be present here. And something to briefly discuss on the future directions. Um, you know, one of the hypotheses of chronic SDH relies heavily on neurovascularization. And that's something Dr. Nopin actually talked about too on his last lecture from uh, last week's seminar. And so I think perhaps maybe looking at, you know, molecules or substances that promote angiogenesis um, could be beneficial in the treatment of chronic subdural uh, hematomas. And perhaps maybe molecules, you know, that tend to promote 
angiogenesis such as VEGF could be imp important in the pathophysiology of this process. Uh, perhaps looking into um, monoclonal antibodies that inhibit VEGF may be beneficial as a treatment. And I think I actually looked at a case report from one group that actually showed that uh, although this was just in two patients that uh, monoclonal antibodies uh, were beneficial in CSDH, um, perhaps a clinical trial um, looking at this would be uh, important to delineate. And that was all. If anybody has any questions, That was really nice. Um, thank you both. I think that was a really great discussion of this paper. You know, I think everyone looked at it and said trial of dexamethasone for chronic subdural hematoma. And there's a, a commentary and editorial right after that. And it was written about how um, long, long ago, Morris Bender, who was a neurologist at Mount Sinai, advocated that that was the only way that you should be treating subdural hematomas, chronic subdurals, is to give them steroids. And it's very interesting that despite, you know, case series and all the things that are out there, um, uh, this, this question was, uh, has been not easily answered. So I actually thought it was really great of the uh, uh, investigators in Cambridge to actually put this together. When they do a trial, they're usually pretty uh, simple about it. They don't, it's not very, um, it's not attached with a whole lot of complicated inclusion and exclusion criteria, which is actually great. But what happened was, is as it turned out, is that it became a trial of routine usage of dexamethasone after surgery. And I don't think that that was their original intention. Uh, and so, because uh, I guess a lot of people getting admitted to the hospital ended up undergoing surgical treatment anyway. So in a sense, I don't think you can make any conclusion about whether or not to use dexamethasone as a primary treatment for chronic subdural hematomas versus using it as a secondary treatment after surgery. I think the results are here is pretty clear. If you have surgery, then giving steroids routinely after steroid, after surgery to try to prevent recurrence is likely going to meet with more risk than benefit. I happen to treat a lot of patients primarily with dexamethasone. I'm gonna be in the process of putting together that entire case series to see what their outcomes were and what their complications were and how many patients ended up needing steer, uh, surgery, how many people failed that, and, and what was the result of giving steroids in judiciously in patients who underwent surgery, but then are noted to have a expansion of their subdural after the surgery, because recurrence is about 20% risk in these patients. Um, so I think that the jury is still out as to whether dexamethasone is a good is a good treatment for primarily, especially when patients are maybe a bit symptomatic or they're not good surgical candidates and, and they could be treated in this manner. So again, I would say that this is a good trial that answers a question about surgery and the routine usage, but I would still say that we don't have the answer yet about whether dexamethasone is really effective for the primary treatment. And we do know from this trial that it did prevent uh, or reduce the risk of recurrence. So there is some benefit in that respect. So, but I think you brought up some really good points. What are the sex differences? We do tend to see more males and females with this particular uh, disorder. Um, but um, there are other things that need to be answered and further studies, obviously. If you have any questions, you can ask now or send them in the chat. We'll be happy to answer them. But I think in the interest of time, we may want to proceed to the next article, unless anyone has any burning questions. 
Yes, as Dr. Oldman said, we uh, please feel free to just send your questions if you do uh, have them and if they do come up. But if not, uh, we can move on to our next presenters. I think we have Hussein and Dissep. Um, Dissep, I think I promoted to you to co-panelists. So when you're ready, you can uh, bring up your slides. Okay, it looks like my video is disabled, but go ahead, Hussein. Um, this, uh, are you putting up the slides or do you want me to do that? I can put it up. Okay. Uh, apparently, my screen sharing is also disabled. Okay. Hussein, let me try to uh, promote you, see if you can, um, or have you, do you have the function to bring up your slides? Let me try to do that. You see my slides? Yes, yes. we can. Thank you. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Hossein Alkars. I'm a second year medical student at GW. And uh, my uh, co presenter. Decep. Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. I'm Decep Ojuku. Uh, I already graduated from medical school, St. George's University School of Medicine. And I'm currently a research assistant at Stanford. Uh, so today we'll be presenting uh, uh, this paper titled Middle Meningeal Artery Embolization uh, for Chronic Subdural Hematomas. Um, it's a study, uh, it's a multi-center study um, across 15 centers uh, here in the United States. Um, here's our outline. Uh, much of uh, the background that I'm going to be talking about was covered by uh, divine, so this will be very short. Um, I just wanted to highlight that uh, the source of the blood is the bridging veins um, between the brain and the dora. And the according to the uh, paper, that borehole irrigation or craniotomies, uh, they have, uh, followed by drainage, are the gold standard. Um, in the patient population where they are symptomatic or where the midline lateral shift is uh, more than five milliliters. The problem with these patients is that they would come with a lot of comorbidities and in a lot of them, we see recurrence. Uh, here they report a percentage between five to 30%. Um, and then the pathophysiology that uh, the current, uh, the current uh, speculation is suggesting is that there are small capillaries that uh, originate from the middle meningeal artery that penetrates the capsule around the hematoma and the bleeding coming from these capillaries are responsible for the recurrence. So to permanently solve this problem, the attempt is to embolize the middle meningeal artery. Um, and in this uh, paper, they were doing it as a standalone procedure without the evacuation. So for the patient selection, they were only looking at chronic subdural hematoma patients. Uh, and then they were using the middle meningeal artery embolization as the primary treatment or as a rescue treatment for patients who had uh, 
reoccurrence uh, after a prior uh, evacuation. The inclusion criteria for these patients are patients who are symptomatic or have a midline shift of more than five millimeters and uh, other patients who have recurrence after the evacuation. And then exclusion criteria, uh, the authors included excluded patients where the, an evacuation concurrent with the middle manager artery embolization was needed. Uh, and they also excluded uh, underlying lesions for the uh, sub, uh, chronic subdural hematoma, such as tumor, vascular lesions, uh, where the uh, source of the bleeding was not the middle meningeal artery. Uh, same thing with the next point, the focal neck convexity, uh, chronic subdural hematoma. These uh, are away from the middle meningeal artery. So um, embolizing these vessels would not resolve the, the problem. They also didn't attempt this procedure in patients some suffering from thrombocytopenia. Um, for their, um, uh, the patient characteristics and the points that they looked at, they uh, used clinical scores such as the NIH stroke scale and the modified Rankin scale. Both of, the, both, both of these uh, looked at the patient's characteristics uh, before and at follow-up after 90 days. And then they also looked at the lesion characteristics, uh, mainly the uh, thickness of the hematoma uh, measured as the largest axial hematoma thickness. Um, and they defined it as the um, lateral deviation of the septum pellucidum uh, away from the midline um, they also looked at the midline shift. Um, I'm sorry, the thickness of the uh, hematoma, and then they also looked at the uh, midline shift. Um, the primary clinical and radi radiological outcomes, um, they looked at uh, mainly two things. The proportion of patients who uh, required additional surgical treatment after the embolization. So, uh, those who had a recurrence, and then the patients who uh, had a major reduction in, in the thickness of the hematoma, and they defined it here as more than 50% of the hematoma, again, at 90 days uh, after follow at follow-up. Uh, they also looked at the uh, how the change related to the uh, embolic materials. Uh, so uh, in these centers, they used a lot of um, materials to embolize the manage middle meningeal artery, and they wanted to see which of those is best. Uh, they mentioned coils, liquid embolics, uh, particles, and uh, they compared, they, they had a linear regression comparing the degree of thickness change and the uh, specific or respective impolic used. Uh, then they also looked at complications. Um, one complication they looked at um, carefully was the craniopathies related to the meningeal artery, um, specifically the uh, ophthalmic artery where some of these particles could a leak into the ophthalmic artery leading to blindness, uh, or the, some of these particles could also move to uh, the vasovasorum of the facial nerve leading to uh, facial palsy. So they paid special attention to that. They also looked at access of complications, mortality, uh, ischemic and hemorrhagic complications, among other uh, that they listed on the next tables. Uh, this step is gonna take it from here. So initially there were 153 patients who had embolization procedures within the 19 months of the study, but of those 153 patients, 15 of them were excluded, either due to loss to follow-up or there was no imaging after 24 hours. So in the final cohort, there were 138 patients who had 154 embolic procedures performed. Next slide. 
So you'll notice at the top of the tables, the N may change, and that's because they looked at patients and then they also looked at procedures. So I'll first go over the patient characteristics. You'll see the N was 138. Uh, the table on the left shows us that the average age of the patient was nearly 70 years old, predominantly males in the cohort. They gave the distribution of reported race and majority of the cohort, uh, over 70% were white. Um, 15 patients actually had bilateral lesions and those were all treated with embolization. Some of the other data that were collected was whether or not the patient was on any antiplatelet medication. So of those who did report being on such medications, majority of them were on aspirin. We could see that nearly 20% of them were on aspirin. And then those who were on anticoagulation therapy, those who were on that type of therapy was um, the most common was warfarin that was being used. So at baseline, the NIHSS mean score was one plus or minus 2.3. I've highlighted in the blue box towards the bottom of the table one. And then the average um, MRS score at baseline was 1.3. So again, this is all preoperatively. Uh, the next table, in table four, shows us patient characteristics after embolization. Uh, the first blue box that's highlighted shows that 13 patients had complications um, after embolization, the most common being symptomatic SDH increase. And then there were 6.5% of the patients who needed retreatment. So these were patients who had to have an operation or another operation. Mortality was 4.4% in their cohort. And after embolization, the mean NIHSS score was, was 0.4, down from 1.0, as I showed you in the previous table. And then looking at the modified Rankin scale score, um, we see that af after embolization, the mean score was 0.7, again, decreased from 1.3 at baseline. Uh, I put on there the text on the right that says the median follow-up time for the patients was nearly 95 days. Next slide. So the figure on the left shows a nice visual of the distribution of the MRS scores um, preoperatively compared to 90 days post-op. And as Divine mentioned earlier, the MRS is a scaled tool that's used to look at severity, uh, especially following a stroke or neurological event. So ideally you want your patients to have an MRS of zero, which means that there's no residual symptom. Um, five, which means that there's severe disability and six, meaning that there was death. So preoperatively 41 patients were in a category of zero. That's that thick blue portion there. Um, and then after embolization, 66 patients had a score of zero. So definitely shows that there was an improvement after embolization. The table there on the right shows us paired T-test results that were performed pair T test being a statistical and a hypothesis test that looks at the means before and after any particular intervention. So in this case, they looked at the mean difference in the SDH thickness, the NIHSS and the MRS preoperatively compared to the last known status. And there on the far right, you'll see the p-values there, and they're all statistically significant because they're less than 0.05. So this shows us that there was a statistically different, statistically significant difference in the means of these particular outcomes, which were their three main numeric outcomes in the study. Next slide. And then when you look at it over time, you can see that there's actually a decreasing trend also over time. So again, uh, you, you, there's the SDH thickness, there's the NIHSS, and there's the MRS. And they looked at each of those preoperatively at 24 hours, two weeks, six weeks, and at 90 days. And at each of those time intervals, there was a slow but sure decrease in the means across time. Next slide. So those were the main patient characteristics. Again, the N was 138. Now you'll see that N is 154 because now we're looking at the procedures, the embolizations themselves. 
So at baseline, the SDH thickness um, was 14 millimeters and the median uh, midline shift was three millimeters. The next table on the right shows us the post-op characteristics. So after embolization, the median SDH thickness decreased to four millimeters. Again, like I said, before the surgery it was 14 millimeters, but now post-op it was four millimeters. And then the second blue box that I highlighted there shows the percent of patients who met that goal, one of their primary outcomes of those who had at least 50% improvement in SDH, SDH thickness, and nearly 71% of their patients met that goal. Next slide. So in looking at the radiographic changes, this gives us a nice visual of one of their patients in the cohort. Um, this was a 96 year old male who had a left MMA embolization. Uh, panel A shows on the left, he has that left convexity that's really clearly delineated there. This was pre-op. Panel B shows um, the same patient three weeks after embolization. And again, you can see on the left, there's still a slight convexity, but not nearly as prominent. And then panel C, same patient, this is at three months post-op, you hardly can see any of the hematoma. The bottom figure there just speaks to what Hussein mentioned earlier um, about the sinusoidal branches that can come off the MMA. Um, the figure on the panel and the in, in figure, the panel A shows the pre-op uh, angiography, and then panel B is the same angiography, but now it's been digitally sub subtracted. So you can see those sinusoids really prominent. And then panel C is after the embolization, you don't see those uh, sinusoids anymore. And this is actually what was called cotton-like blushing in the article. Next slide. So in terms of the embolization procedure, the blue box on the on table three at the bottom shows that over 97% of their procedures were classified as successful. And as Hussein mentioned, they use a variety of different embolic agents. Uh, in that blue box, it shows you a nice distribution, the most common being particles and coils, followed by particles only, and then liquid embolics. So even though they used many different embolic agents, they wanted to know whether or not these different embolic agents had any difference amongst them in terms of the outcome, the outcome being reduction in SDH thickness. So in table eight, they displayed their re linear regression results. And you can see in the blue box that all of them are not statistically significant. So none of the embolic agents showed any um, statistical influence on the outcome variable of reduction in SDH thickness. Next slide. So most of the cases in this study were actually first time intervention cases. And in almost 96% of the cases, um, MMA embolization stopped the expansion of the hematoma or it decreased the lesion to the point that it could resolve in about three months after the surgery was performed. And I showed you this head CT as an example of one of the patients in which this happened. The results also support that MMA embolization is an effective means of controlling or resolving chronic SDH. And overall, the functional outcome improved in the study. Reoperation was needed in less than 7% of the patients. And as Hussein mentioned earlier, uh, the functional scales were something that they looked at and assessed, but they were not used as primary outcome measures in this study. And that's because in their opinion, the MRS gives a good overall gross functional state of the patient. But in patients who have chronic subdural hematomas, their symptoms tend to be quite subtle and improvement is usually reported by their caregiver or family member. Also, the NIHSS, uh, they did not see that as a, an appropriate measure because, again, it didn't really fit well with their patient population. And so instead of focusing on the functional scales as their primary outcome, they instead looked at radiographic changes and the need for reoperation. Next slide. 
So as I pointed out to you earlier with the um, linear regression results, so although liquid embolics at times can be quite challenging to work with because it could go into deeper vessels in the brain and it can be uncontrolled at times, uh, they did not show any statistical difference in the agents that were used. MMA is also effective at resolving those cotton-like um, blushing that I showed you earlier on the angiogram. Complications were low in this study, which is quite beneficial, especially for the elderly um, and those who have comorbidities. Uh, Hussein talked about the complications that could arise due to uh, the embolic agent penetrating the ophthalmic artery, also the facial nerve. And so they tried to avoid some of these complications by identifying potentially dangerous collaterals when they did the angiograph. And in this study, 8.5% of the cases had these collaterals and they were able to successfully avoid them in all cases by keeping the catheter tip distal to the collateral. Operative mortality was 4.4%, which is actually comparable to open surgery, which ranges from 1.2 to 3.8%. Next slide. Some limitations to this study, the authors identified several of them, one being that the selection of patients who underwent MMA embolization was based primarily on the surgeon's preference. So this would introduce a sampling bias into the study. Also, there was variability in the technical, sorry, in the surgical technique that was used from one center to another. Uh, each center had their own team that collected and analyzed data. There was no independent data collection entity, which could be problematic. Uh, also, even though this was a prospective study, there was no randomization that was mentioned uh, in which they may have randomized some patients to open evacuation treatment. The authors also mentioned that uh, there could be missing data that would influence or bias some of the findings uh, in the study. Three other limitations that I identified is that they did not mention if there was blinding involved in this study uh, because they didn't have an independent analytical team. Um, it's possible that they did not have single, double or triple blinding in this study. The other limitation I identified is that uh, they didn't say who actually did the assessment and interpretation of the imaging to determine the SD, uh, SDH thickness and if more than one person was used for that analysis or interpretation, was their inter-rater reliability performed to make sure that one person's assessment is, is similar to the other person's? And then the last limitation that I identified is they mentioned that they used 15 centers nationwide. They didn't talk about the distribution of those centers in terms of how they were selected, where they were in the United States, and whether there were any geographic differences. Next slide. So in conclusion, this was a large perspective US-based multi-center study, the first of its kind, in which 138 patients underwent 154 MMA embolizations. With a mean follow-up of almost 95 days, 71% uh, of patients reached um, their, one of their primary outcomes, which is at least 50% reduction in SDH thickness. And they had improvements in outcome measures in both the NIHS, NIHSS, and the MRS. So overall results show that MMA embolization may provide a safe and efficacious alternative to conventional surgical techniques, which are the gold standard. So next slide, I think our references, and thank you very much. Stop sharing. Well, thank you to Seth and um, Hussein. That was a great uh, summarization of this, uh, or summary of this article. It's actually a very interesting one. Um, so I, th I think to address some of your points on the, on the limitations of the study is that it is a single arm study. I don't think they blinded. No, one, nothing's blinded here. But they actually, you do know the centers because you just have to look at the affiliations of the authors, and those are your centers. And I, I strongly, I strongly doubt that the centers that they mentioned had that much variability in in uh, their ability uh, in their equipment and the ability to. Uh, attract patients. I, I think these are major centers that 
uh, like Baylor and, and um, there's Lenox Hill Hospital in, uh, in, in Manhattan and, and Buffalo. So there's a whole bunch of centers that are, are endovascular centers. Um, the other thing, and, and Cornell, uh, Cornell has been uh, a real leader in this particular uh, technique in dealing with chronic subdurals. So I think that, that it's important to understand that there is some sound basis of, on this, uh, such as the blush, uh, when you do uh, middleman jewel and um, artery uh, selective angiography, you'll, you could see a faint blush of the, of the capsule or the sac around the subdural, so which means that there is blood supply being derived from the dural feeders. So this is the whole premise of this particular treatment. So the whole goal is to try to see if you can cut that blood supply, will you ultimately shrink this, um, this subdural? And uh, I think it's much more that we, we don't need subdural control, we need subdural resolution. And I think that's really the goal in the vast majority of cases is to resolve the subdural to a point where they are mostly or all gone. Uh, and there are some patients that will not achieve a hundred percent resorption of their subdural. You have to accept just a little bit maybe, uh, but there are many patients that will resolve almost pretty much a hundred percent. And, and that has implications because if you even have a small, uh, if you have a persistent subdural hematoma, then the patient needs to be aware that if they fall or hurt themselves, they're gonna bleed into that compartment. And that's something we don't want to leave there uh, intentionally unless, unless there's no other choice. Uh, we wanna see the best way we can try to resolve that. A lot of the patients take uh, antiplatelets or anticoagulations, so you would need to stop that. And if you're treating these things conservatively, uh, just stopping those medication may be enough to reverse all the effects of the, um, uh, that occur when these uh, chronic subdurals form. And it's not really even clear as to why, uh, you know, just stopping that may resolve the subdural um, where you're just not providing any impetus for hemorrhage. Um, but I think for MMA embolization, this is really the one treatment that we actually think that we can directly uh, solve a problem. We can directly stop the process by cutting off the blood supply. It makes a lot of intuitive sense. So it's very promising. So right now there are several uh, trials going on. One is called Embolese, which is part of uh, Medtronic. Um, and they have a specific embolic, liquid embolic agent uh, called Onyx. Unfortunately, I, you know, there's no other embolic agent like it. Um, and it's very viscous and, and they use it a lot for AVMs and, uh, and, uh, because they're very good at reaching a lot of the small vessels for AVMs. And so they're using that particular uh, agent to try to expand the indications for it. And they're using MMA embolization as part of that uh, uh, attempt to expand the indications. And it really, you know, it has a potential of so wide usage. If, if chronic subdurals are gonna be the number one operation in older adults or the number one neurosurgical operation in 2030, it certainly makes sense to wanna to try to expand the indications of your product to include that population. It may very well be that the vast majority of patients may actually do very well from just doing this and, and may rarely need to have any other treatment. So I, uh, we are uh, Northwell, uh, uh, North Shore University Hospitals where I work and we're a site for embolies. We also have our own investigator initiated trial on MMA embolization. So embolese does the embolization before surgery, and then there's an observational arm. So you observe versus give uh, do, do MMA embolization. 
or you have an actual um, surgical arm, but you have to do that before. In our own investigator initiated study, we actually have um, uh, people undergoing surgery and then getting MMA embolization afterwards. It's hard to know whether before or after is good. Uh, I just know we did one case where we did the embolese trial where we did it on on Monday and on Tuesday, we took the patient to the OR for burr holes and that we saw the onyx inside of the dural vessels. It was actually pretty cool. And when we cut open the dura, the dura was bone dry. It didn't even bleed. So it's pretty amazing. So we were all very happy. We took pictures and then, and the patient uh, had a wonderful evacuation. And usually with older patients, patients in his eighties, 85, you know, there's always a residual because the brain doesn't re-expand back to the dura quickly and his re-expanded very nicely. So I'm not so sure whether that's related to the embolization or, or just this patient, but I think it's very interesting. And I think it's a very exciting field for the treatment of chronic subdural. So I, I mean, I, I think that there's a value to a study like this because it actually is almost like a phase one, two, mm -hmm. kind of showing efficacy and safety mm -hmm. uh, with, but so you're not, this is not a phase three trial by any stretch, but what mm -hmm. their take was that this was now a trial that was multi-centered. So you aren't just doing a single center. And also, cause you also had uh, used some outcome scores like modified Rankin to try to correlate that. So I think that that was, uh, you know what they tried to do to distinguish themselves for this particular trial. So more to come on this whole subject. And it really, it, this is a potential game changer for the disease process. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, does anyone have questions out there or do um, you guys have any comments? You know, there was um, one question from the previous, uh, just Armando had asked, um, uh, his question was after the revision, which type of patients are candidates for primary management uh, with dexamethasone? And so uh, the patients that I tend to use dexamethasone in primarily are those patients who uh, don't have very large collections and then are, are not that symptomatic. So I, I will tend to use that, but I have used it in large collections in symptomatic patients who are hemiparetic, who just couldn't undergo surgery. And I've loaded them with a lot of dex. You have to load them with like 10 milligrams and then four Q6 for several days. And those things can go away over time. So it's actually pretty remarkable um, how dexamethasone can help. We don't know the time course to resolution or whether MMA embolization is any faster than doing surgery or doing dexamethasone alone or surgery plus any of those treatments. We don't know that. And that's what's lacking in a lot of these um, is, uh, studies is their rate to recurrence. So some of the MMA embolizations uh, write-ups and case series have lacked that time to resolution. So here you say, oh, greater than 50% reduction in the subdural hematoma. I mean, it, we really want to know how long did it take for this subdural to get better to be minuscule? And so we have to pick a number, like say 90% uh, reduction. And we still don't really have that answer. We think the time course is probably about the same. And so usually 90 days is, uh, is a key towards the resolution of these particular um, uh, collections. And, uh, but you know, every patient is different and some patients you're following for a lot longer and some people resolve a lot shorter. So it's not a, a quick, quick and fast and, uh, resolution to the problem, but it's certainly a, a much less invasive way, but nothing is without risk. Blindness is the most feared risk of it. And unfortunately in our center, we've seen maybe two or three patients to have developed unilateral blindness from this. So it's not, uh, it's, they, they didn't report any in this particular patient uh, series, but uh, unfortunately it has happened and, and it is something that we do not wanna see happen. So there's a lot that we have to do. So I guess, um, uh, I guess if there are no other questions, maybe we'll move on to the next one or the last one. Thank the you. Last is not least. Thank you.
All right. Hello, everyone. Can everyone see my uh, screen fine? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, awesome. So, hello, everyone. My name is Siyuan Yu, and I'm a third year medical student at Cooper Medical School. And today I'm going to be discussing the journal club article Dream Type After Borehole Drainage of Chronic Subdural Hematoma in Geriatric Patients. A sub analysis of the chronic subdural uh, hematoma during randomized control trial. And it's essentially, this is a, a subgroup analysis of the original trial, as you hear and see here in the title. And this is by Gruder et al. Okay, so just give a little bit of background. I know everyone has already mentioned uh, the, some of the background. So it's an encapsulated collection of old liquefied blood. And again, we mentioned it usually happens in the sixth to seventh decades, right? The incidence is. Uh, low in the general population, five out of 100,000, but when you consider patients 70 years and older, and you know, as the, uh, the patient continues to age and we're living longer, the incidence is gonna be much higher with time. And here, just briefly mention the, the risk factors, right? So old age, fall, anticoagulations, low intracranial pressure, and some of the common presentations will be gradual changes in, alter mental, in, their, uh, in the patient's mental status. Uh, some of the other ones include focal neurological deficits, uh, headaches, some of the rare ones I saw were, you know, also have dementia presenting as uh, chronic subdurals, as well as Parkinsonian uh, symptoms from, uh, from subdurals. And here we can see uh, the subdural can present as isodense, mixed dense, or hypodense on non-contrast CT. So we see here in the left convexity, we see a, a, a hypodense, iso, uh, hypodense uh, convexity lesion here, and we see here is a iso, uh, hypodense as well as a hyperdense lesion. So this indicates a chronic subdural hematoma. And here indicates a chronic sub, uh, acute on chronic uh, subdural hematoma. Uh, so some of the, so one distinction I wanna make, um, I think we didn't talk about before is the difference between acute subdural hematoma versus chronic subdural hematoma. So in patients who are acute is usually in much younger patients and usually occurs after major trauma, such as a motor vehicle accident or a fall from a, like a very uh, uh, high place, such well, as well as uh, assault to the brain, such as a blow to the head or trauma to the head from a gunshot wound. And there are also structural brain damages associated with them, like intrapericle hemorrhage, intrapericle hemorrhage, as well as fractures in the brain, uh, just some other examples. And they usually acute very, uh, present very acutely from, that, uh, from a specific event, usually within 72 hours. However, when you're talking about chronic uh, subdural hematoma, you're really talking about elderly patients with trivial injuries without a direct injury to the brain that they can, uh, people can uh, account for. For example, over 30 to 50% of cases, people do not know a specific incident where that was caused. Rather, they're much more indirect uh, injuries to the brain, such as like a whiplash or a quick turning of the head or so on. And people don't really know, sometimes don't know what caused the subdural or the chronic subdural. And as mentioned before, we talked about different types of surgical techniques we mentioned. So just in general, the mortality rate, so again, uh, as mentioned, it's like two to 2, two to 4% and the recurrence rate However, it's pretty high and there's, you know, different types of uh, procedures depending on the size of the hole that we're making. So we're, we're seeing a twist drill, we're really seeing less than five, five millimeter in diameter. And we're talking about burr hole is usually five to 30 millimeters in diameter. And then we're talking about craniotomy is usually uh, greater than 30 millimeters. And, and um, so what we wanna focus on is the mortality that comes with each procedure. So mortal, uh, I'm sorry, morbidity. So the morbidity of craniotomy is, is higher, much higher than that of a craniostomy as listed here. And although the twist drill has the lowest morbidity, it has the highest rate of reoccurrence when you compare that to a burr hole or craniotomy. As you can see here, it's a two, uh, it's a two burr hole system where they're doing irrigation in the, in the patient. Okay, so, so now we know that um, the optimum, I'm sorry, the other thing I wanna mention is that uh, the burr hole drill is the most commonly used procedure for uh, treatment of a chronic subdural hematoma. And so the next thing we wanna talk about is the, the effects of drain versus no drain. So, so in the study by Centurion and all, uh, when in 2009, they randomized patients into a uh, chronic subdural hematoma with a uh, Burr hole, they randomized into drain and no drain. And essentially what they show is that with drain placement, there was a decreased mortality and decreased rate of uh, chronic subdural hematoma recurrence, which made, um, which is one of the studies that made uh, burr, hole, burr hole with drain placement the, uh, the gold standard of treatment. 
for chronic subdural hematoma. Uh, following that study, uh, Salman and all uh, examined the effect of subdural drain versus subperiosteal drain, and to see whether that had a difference in outcomes in patients with uh, after birth hole for subdural hematoma. As you can see here, here's a schematic of a subdural drain that's placed after uh, evacuation uh, into the subdural space. And then there's another drain that's placed in the, uh, in the subperiosteal space. And the, the rationale for that is that is if you have a subdural drain, that could theoretically cause more damage to the brain because it's the drain itself is so close to the brain pericon and that could you know, have some uh, uh, mortality, possible mortality and morbidity associated with that. So here's the study. They had 220 patients and they were divided into one group receiving the subdural drain, one group receiving the subperiosteal drain. And when we looked at the primary outcome, which was reoccurrence at 12 months, uh, although there was a 3.7% favoring a subperiosteal drain, it did not reach a, a significance as preset in the study. Therefore, you conclude that well, the authors conclude that there was similar recurrence rate between the two groups, whether it was subdural versus subperiosteal. However, what is interesting to know is that when we look at the secondary outcome, we see that the subperiosteal group had significantly less infections on follow-up and the subperiosteal group has significantly less rate of misplacement defined as uh, placement into the brain paracon uh, in the subperiosteal um, group. There was no difference in outcome or mortality at, uh, at a 12 month follow-up. So the authors concluded from that study was that subperiosteal drain could be, uh, could be useful in everyday clinical practice. So, our, so going back to our study. So our study is a subgroup analysis of uh, patients uh, comparing drain types between the subdural type and the subperiosteal type. But specifically for our study, we're looking at elderly patients and elderly patients are defined patients as uh, age 80 and older. Okay, so here is a subgroup analysis of the original trial we mentioned. It's a, it was a, the original trial was a two-center randomized control non inferiority trial of 220 patients. So from that group, we're taking 104 patients from that group and we're looking at this analysis and to see what uh, their outcome. And again, the primary outcome was chronic subdural hematoma recurrence rate defined as the, as the ipsilateral uh, chronic subdural, sub, subdural hematoma site. And some of the secondary outcomes or clinical and radiological outcomes, uh, drain misplacement rates and mortality and morbidity outcomes. And the study length was 12 months. Okay, so now we're looking at the results. So initially the authors uh, compared uh, patient outcome between patients that were less than 80 and patients that were older than 80, irrespective of what type of drain that were used. And essentially what the, oh sorry, Essentially, what the authors found was that at baseline, as expected, patients that are older, 80 years and older, had worse functional status outcome in uh, at baseline, and they also had more morbidities at baseline. And also, as expected, postoperatively, patients that are greater than 80 years and older have worse functional status as measured by ML, uh, modified ranking score and more uh, medical complications and total complications when compared to patients that are younger than 80. Uh, this is irrespective of which uh, drain type was used. So in a regression model, uh, uh, the authors wanted to see whether there were any association between an outcome of medical complication with uh, drainage type. And they also found that the authors concluded that age was an in independent predictor of medical complications after surgical evacuation uh, with, OA, with patients older than 80 having more, uh, more likelihood of having, having uh, medical complications. However, drain type, uh, you know, whether subdural versus a uh, subperiosteal drain do not have any impact on med medical complications. And as you can see here, this is the, the reoccurrence, the time to reoccurrence. And here we develop into less than 80, older than 80, and the drain time, and there was no difference uh, between the groups. Okay, so now this analysis, now the authors focus more on the original question, which was in patients 80 years and older, does drink different type of drinks make a any, any significant difference in outcome in terms of reoccurrence. And what the authors uh, found was that, oops, okay. There was no difference in the rate of reoccurrence, 12.8% in the subdural group and 8.2% in the subperiosteal um, group, 
or mortality in elderly patients. As you can see here, this is the time to reoccurrence, 0.2, no significance. However, what the authors found in their secondary, um, per secondary outcome was that there was significant higher rate of uh, drain misplacement in the sub in the subdural group. No, uh, no, mis uh, no misplacements were uh, seen in the subperiosteal group, whereas 20% in the subdural group. However, it is important to, uh, to mention that although there's a higher rate of misplacement, there was no difference in mortality or morbidity um, in long-term outcome. And lastly, there was a non-significant trend towards higher surgical mobility in the sub uh, in the subdural group versus the uh, uh, subdural drainage group versus the subper osteo drainage group uh, at 0 0.07. However, as we mentioned before, this is a subgroup analysis, so the study was not designed to see, uh, not designed or powered to detect significant significant differences in primary or secondary outcome. Therefore, none was seen in, uh, in the study. Uh, okay, so, so just in conclusion, what we see here is that 47% of the study population in this cohort is greater than 80, and we expect the number to, um, to go up with, um, with the aging population. Uh, patients that are older than 80, as expected and as previously reported, do worse um, in terms of their morbidity and mortality compared to younger patients. So there was no difference in a uh, subperiosteal uh, group versus the subdural group in terms of uh, reoccurrence. There were no difference in morbidity or functional outcomes in, uh, in the two groups besides their mock water score at 12 months follow-up. There was significant high drain, uh, drain misplacement in the sub, uh, subdural, uh, subdural drain group. And due to the authors concluded that due to the high rate of misplacement, subperiosteal groups should be considered in, patient, in elderly patients. Uh, to decrease the rate of uh, uh, drain, uh, mid drain dis, uh, misplacement. And again, the limitation, as we had mentioned, that this was a subgroup post hoc analysis, and it was underpowered to detect primary and secondary outcomes seen uh, that, that were seen as trends in, um, in the study. Just to talk a little bit about future directions, and some were already, we had already mentioned, uh, we could consider, uh, especially in patients that are much older, uh, you know, 80 and above, or high perioperative, perioperative risk. We could consider steroid management as the sole management. We could consider transdemic acid as the sole management. We could consider mannitol, statins, ACE inhibitors that have all been uh, reported in the literature as, as having a possible role for conservative management in elderly patients with uh, chronic subdurals. And lastly, uh, as we mentioned before, another one I want to consider is the less inv invasive procedure or the minimum meningeal uh, artery, which the previous group had done a really good job of, uh, of mentioning. And that is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Siwon. Anyone have questions about this? Oh, that was great. Um, so, do you did you have you would look like you were about to say something? Oh yeah, no, I was just want to mention men, one thing. So. I was a little bit confused by their analysis because they look into patients less than 80 and greater than 80, but I thought their original objective was to see drainage and their impact on patients, uh, you know, 80 and older. So I was kind of confused by their initial analysis of comparing patients less than 80 and greater than 80, irrespective of drainage type. What do you mean in the, in the paper that you reviewed? for the Yeah, yeah. So for example, the first yeah. part I looked at, they compare patients less than 80 and greater than 80, and they looked at difference in mortality and morbidity, irrespective of the type of drain that was used. And I thought that, was, that wasn't the question they were asking initially, which was, does drain type have an effect on patients greater than 80? Uh, yes, I, that's their main thing is whether or not, I'm looking at this here, whether or not you actually, whether the subperiosteal versus the subdural drain um, mm -hmm. had had a positive or negative effect on the outcome, morbidity, mortality, and length of stay on the radiological outcome, clinical and radiological outcome, morbidity, mortality rate, and length of stay. But if I'm reviewing this as a, as a journal reviewer, and I know that they had a, a um, I'm sorry, that was actually the other study because I pulled the other study and I think, uh, but it was still pretty much the same, um, you know, primary outcome measures. 
but this is a post hoc, uh, you know, sub analysis of the eight, over 80 group, because I think it brings up a good question as to whether or not you are, you know, in that 80 group, will they benefit more from the subperiosteal less invasive drain than the younger age group. So as a reviewer, I wouldn't let this paper go by without that comparative analysis between the less than 80 group and the over 80 group or 80 plus group, because you need to really know, I mean, what, what, why should this be important? And really what were the differences in there? So, um, so it, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's that's just really an important aspect of it because it's it almost becomes a so what <laughs> yeah, unless you have that comparison. And why not? They have that comparison. That's their whole entire study. And they get two great papers out of this, don't they? They get two great publications, both in uh, neurosurgery. Um, you know, what's interesting about this is because this is something that I don't think many people do. And so we're talking about Switzerland and, and uh, here we have um, uh, the original paper uh, was in uh, Switzerland. Oh, and neurosurgical focus, I'm sorry. The, our paper is in neurosurgical focus. So yes, this is a European thing. So, but it's, it, it, it makes somewhat of intuitive sense as if the older the patient or, you know, maybe even sometimes the younger the patient, would this be a better way of doing it? Sort of indirect drainage as opposed to direct subdural drainage. And so when you're talking about the subperiosteal drain, what you're doing is basically tunneling it under the periosteum because that that's a a layer that should actually help hold that drain. Rather, if you were above the periosteum between that loose areolar plane between the galea and the uh, pericranium. And so your drain won't move around that much. So I think it's sort of like a self anchor. Maybe that's why they're using it in that fashion. And then, uh, and then you're indirectly draining it through uh, what we call a number seven. I believe that they're using the flat Jackson Pratt drain. So it's a nice wide Jackson Pratt drain, which I believe that they possibly use intradurally. Uh, these are big flat drains and I even don't like using them in the subdural space because they're big, they're flat and people have bled from trying to pull these things out. We use a really thin, what's called the soft seven Jackson, soft round seven Jackson Pratt drain. So it's a really flexible, very soft, thin drain. It's it maybe even a little thinner than a ventriculostomy catheter. And so that, that drain is actually really super soft. It gets in there and hardly any, you know, very few bleeding complications when that thing comes out. Um, and and it may be very helpful in patients that are younger who expand their brain to their skull faster, even during the case, than an older patient that that brain stays down there. And, and so I don't necessarily even find it a problem to put that subdural drain in these older, older patients that just don't re-expand. But if the patient has re-expanded and you can't fit any drain in there, um, then instead of not putting a drain, which is often then what we had done is just not put a drain there, putting it, laying it over in that subperiosteal plane is a great alternative. And I think this paper shows us that it's a decent alternative. Now, we also have another alternative for a less invasive procedure. It's called the SEPS, a subdural evacuation port system. And that's from Medtronic, which has been the Embolese, uh, you know, trial sponsor. And they, they have this twist drill that you put in there, you, you know, and then you puncture the dura and you puncture the membrane and the subdural comes out, but then you twist the bolt into the head and then you stick the, the tubing of a Jackson Pratt drain with the bulb onto the bolt and then you pinch the bulb and you are now draining the subdural through a small twist drill hole without having putting anything 
into the intracranial space. So that in itself may save people some of the potential risks of having a tube in that space. It's also a smaller hole. Uh, so, but you know, there could be complications from that too. I've seen people who have bled out, you know, uh, because of that sudden release of pressure and maybe some suction develop subarachnoid hemorrhage and other things. I've seen that happen, but it's rare. Uh, so, but those, those drains um, can actually have a fairly good uh, success rate. Uh, one study I think had a, a lot of patients that they did these sepsis over the course of a lot of time. And they actually found that um, over time, with the improvement and getting used to the technique with the learning curve that they went from like a 15% recurrence rate with this type of procedure down to like a 3% recurrence rate because they got used to the procedure. They knew all the nuances and they were able to be more successful with that. So I would say that this subperiosteal should be in our armamentarium. I have to say that in an older person though, the periosteal is pretty adherent to the skull. All right. And that's why you don't get that many cephalohematomas. They, they, you know, it's very adherent layer and, and you're just scraping that stuff off of the skull when you're doing a standard craniotomy. Right. So I, I would suspect in many of these patients, they actually didn't do it subperiosteal. It's not a great plane. They probably just like ream the periosteum and tunneled it towards the other hole and just left the drain with the holes over each of the burr holes. So, uh, so I'm a little suspect when they're saying pericranium, uh, a subpericranial, that's, that's not, uh, I, I suspect that in a lot of these patients that wasn't necessarily accomplished, but I would applaud them if they did. So it just is from a practical standpoint. Uh, but I, you know, there are many ways to treat chronic subdurals and we haven't mentioned some of the other uh, other nuanced treatments, such as giving tranexamic acid, which is like um, uh, anti-thrombolytic and like amino, you know, um, Amicar, um, Epsilon amino caproic acid, which was given, uh, which we gave for aneurysms. Uh, sometimes people give that so that we prevent aneurysmal re-rupture while you're waiting to treat them. It just as so, and then, I don't know if, if you, anyone has, if you have seen anyone be operated on, on one of those particular drugs, if you give that IV, it's bone dry. You can't really get a one red blood cell because it's so good at hemostasis. So some people have used tranexamic acid as an oral drug over a 30, you know, maybe three month period of time until the subdural resolves. Um, and that's been shown to be, have some success. And some people have injected it into the subdural after drainage. Um, some people have even used TPA, interestingly enough, um, unclear. Um, as to what that mechanism is, maybe that's to just sort of release the pressure from the blood vessels. I'm, I'm not really sure about that. Don't try that at home. I wouldn't, I wouldn't particularly recommend it. Uh, but the TXA is another alternative we were looking to experiment with. But once the MMA started coming out and more interest in that, we kind of dropped the, the tranexamic acid idea. So again, um, I think you know, the way we have it, we do have the main surgical procedures. We now have the embolization procedure that's uh, very promising. And subperiosteal is just another way of ensuring drainage, which you mentioned the Santorius article, which was a very important article about drainage versus no drain. So it, it, no matter how you drain it, you should be draining it for the most part, unless you can't. Um, and I think that's really the take home message. And here they have an example of a way of draining it without having to actually go inside. So any questions from the, from the, from the audience? I appreciate everybody staying on. This has been a really great discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Ullman. Really appreciate your insight on this topic. And uh, thank you for everybody for, for staying because, um, you know, we did go over, but it was some pretty interesting stuff being presented. So also thank you to the presenters as well.
everyone, Ryan Rad here from NeurosurgeryTraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.